Hi, I'm Mother Kaushik, and I'm going to be reading a few poems from some of our faculty and alumni poets here at Rutgers. First, I'm going to start with a few poems by Alicia Ostreicher, faculty poet. The first one is called Daffodils, and it begins with two epigraphs. Ten thousand saw I at a glance, tossing their heads in sprightly dance. William Wordsworth. Going to hell so many times tears it, which explains poetry. Jack Spicer. The day the war against Iraq begins, I'm photographing the yellow daffodils. With their outstretched arms and ruffled cups blowing in the wind of Jesus Green, edging the lush, grassy, moving river, along with the swans and ducks under a soft, March Cambridge sky, embellishing the earth like a hand starting to illustrate a children's book, where people in light clothes come out to play, to frisk and run about with their lovers, friends, animals, and children. As down every stony back road of history, they've always done in the peaceful springs, which in a sense, is also hell, because the daffodils do look as if they dance, and make some of us in the park want to dance and breathe deeply. And I know that being able to eat and incorporate beauty like this, I am privileged, and by that token can taste pain, roll it on my tongue. It's good. The cruel wars are good. The stupidity is good. The primates hiding in their caves are very good. They do their best, which explains poetry. What explains poetry is that life is hard, but better than the alternatives, the no and the nothing. Look at this light and color, a splash of brilliant yellow punctuating an emerald text White swans and mottled brown ducks floating quietly along, whole and alive, like an untorn language that lacks nothing, that excludes nothing, period. Don't you think it is our business to defend it, even the day our masters start a war, to defend the day that we see the daffodils? Next by Alicia Ostreicher, The Blessing of the Old Woman, the Tulip, and the Dog. To be blessed, said the old woman, is to live and work so hard, God's love washes right through you like milk through a cow. To be blessed, said the dark red tulip, is to knock their eyes out with the slug of lust implied by your upended skirt. To be blessed, said the dog, is to have a pinch of God inside you and all the other dogs can smell it. Next by Alicia Ostreicher, The Change. Happening now, it is happening now even while after these gray March weeks, when every Saturday you drive out of town into the country to take your daughter to her riding lesson and along the thin curving road, you peer into the brown stuff, still tangled, bare, nothing beginning. Nothing beginning, the mud, the vines, the corpse-like trees and their floor of sodden leaves unaltered. It makes you want to pull the steering wheel from its socket or tear your own heart out, exasperated that it should freeze and thaw, then freeze again, and that no buds have burst sticky deep red from their twigs. You want to say it to your daughter. You want to tell her also how the gray beeches, ashes, and oaks on Cherry Hill Road on the way to her riding school feel the same, although they cannot rip themselves up by the roots or run about raving or take any action whatever and are almost 
dead with their wish to be alive, to suck water, to send force through their fibers and to change, to change. Next, we have a few poems by faculty poet Mark Doty. The first one is called Brian, age seven. Grateful for their tour of the pharmacy, the first grade class has drawn these pictures, each self-portrait taped to the window glass, faces wide to the street, round and available, with parallel lines for hair. I like this one best, Brian, whose attenuated name fills a quarter of the frame stretched beside impossible legs descending from the ball of his torso, two long arms springing from that same central sphere. He breathes here on his page. It isn't craft that makes this figure come alive. Brian draws just balls and lines in wobbly crayon strokes. Why do some marks seem to thrill with life, possess a portion of the nervous energy in their maker's hand? That big curve of a smile reaches nearly to the rim of his face. He holds a towering ice cream, brown spheres teetering on their cone. A soda fountain gift, half the length of him, as if it were the flag of his own country held high by the unadorned black line of his arm. Such naked support for so much delight, artless boy, He's found a system of beauty. He shows us pleasure and what pleasure resists. The ice cream is delicious. He's frail beside his relentless standard. Next by Mark Doty, The Death of Antinous. When the beautiful young man drowned accidentally, swimming at dawn in a current too swift for him, or obedient to some cult of total immersion that promised the bather would come up divine, mortality rinsed from him. Hadrian placed his image everywhere, a marble Antinous staring across the public squares where a few dogs always scuffled, planted in every squalid little crossroads at the furthest corners of the empire. What do we want in any body but the world? And if the lover's inimitable form was nowhere, then he would find it everywhere, though the boy became simply more dead as the sculptors embodied him. Wherever Hadrian might travel, the beloved figure would be there. First, the turn of his shoulders the exact marble nipples, the drowned face, not really lost to the Nile, which has no appetite, really takes in anything without judgment or expectation, but lost into its own multiplication, an artifice rubbed with oils and acid so that the skin might shine. Which of these did I love? Here is his hair, here his hair again. Here the chiseled liquid waste I hold because I cannot hold it. If only one of you, he might have said to any of the thousand marble boys anywhere, would speak. Or the statues might have been enough, the drowned boy blurred as much by memory as by water, molded toward an essential remote ideal. Longing, of course, become its own object the way that desire can make anything into a god. Last by Mark Doty, a display of mackerel. They lie in parallel rows, on ice, head to tail, each a foot of luminosity, barred with black bands, which divide the scale's radiant sections like seams of lead in a Tiffany window. Iridescent, watery prismatics. Think abalone, the wildly rainbowed mirror of a soap bubble sphere. Think sun on gasoline. 
splendor and splendor and not a one in any way distinguished from the other, nothing about them of individuality. Instead, they're all exact expressions of the one soul, each a perfect fulfillment of heaven's template, mackerel essence. As if, after a lifetime arriving at this enameling, the jewelers made uncountable examples, each as intricate in its oily fabulation as the one before. Suppose we could iridesce, like these, and lose ourselves entirely in the universe of shimmer. Would you want to be yourself only? Unduplicatable, doomed to be lost? They'd prefer, plainly, to be flashing participants, multitudinous. Even now, they seem to be bolting forward, heedless of stasis. They don't care they're dead and nearly frozen, just as, presumably, they didn't care that they were living. All, all for all, the rainbowed school and its acres of brilliant classrooms, in which no verb is singular, or everyone is. How happy they seem, even on ice, to be together, selfless, which is the price of gleaming. Next, we have a few poems by alumni poet Purvi Shah. The first one is called, Her Hands Are a Furnace. Her hands are a furnace, warmed by the light of God, or maybe her dark mother fed her coals for breakfast in youth, hoping to kindle the child's black meat into diamond. Wayfarers scout the country to enclose her hands, these oracles of heat. She sears migrants with warm shelter. She simmers their cold burn with hope, imparts companions. Her hands are a furnace, he says, and shies away. He wants to lead her to the coldest chamber in his American home envelop her sun-spackled wrists from the homeland in his brown palms. He seeks to teach his nerves how warmth is spread. When he clasps her hands, he too imagines he is planted on stone floors, underneath a flat roof, sun-puncturing sizzle after monsoon rains. His palms are soft, uncarved, she discerns. It is not easy being a holder of heat, a foreigner to fevered belonging. She curtains her eyes, trained to hide the smoldering. Next, by Purvi Shah, Mira longs to be more than a bride. The sound of your footsteps is waterfall. Why not thrust off these bangles then? You are already music, and in your hands, I am wordless sound in your wordless sound. Note this concert of veils lifting and fires crossing. A palanquin came to witness how my head adorned by marigold can bow, can summon Deep golden fetters of dawn, how night consorts with day to disappear, how we alone burn for the fire of being. We too will know what pulse clinks our breaths as twins in a mother's pouch, both their own and not own, our original unchambered heart. I shall wear the moon or your heartbeat only around my wrist. Last, by Purvi Shah, we have, Mina pushes aside the mountain you are climbing. Desire is never one way. Black snails, black snakes crawl through your throat. The divine longs for human proximity to divinity. The divine longs for touch. You have not wanted a body and you have wanted. A careless tongue can make chatter, but unrequited love 
can make an avalanche. Your teeth chatter and you know somewhere a funeral parade is moving, one ant after another marching. Your snake shed its skins as the curve of a pilgrimage awaiting dawn. Heaven is too much a metaphor to be of use to a lover weeping for a false love. Every shaman needs a healer and every god a devotee they can admire. When God comes back from the pilgrimage, you are more plump. Everyone can see your wisdom sprouting, this time dangerous. Even women will cast stones. Watch the people's hands. They carry shards of their half-spoken dreams. But you have invented an embrace. In the first worship, you make the one devoted to devotion, devoted to you. You bring the mountain into your lips. Without prayer, your mouth blooms. Last, we have a few poems by our faculty poet, Evie Shockley. The first one is called, Where You Are Planted. He's as high as a Georgia pine, my father'd say, half laughing. Southern trees as measure, metaphor. Highways lined with kazoo-covered southern trees. Fuchsia, lavender, white, light pink, purple. Crepe myrtle bouquets burst open on sturdy branches of skin smooth bark. My favorite southern trees. 100 degrees in the shade, we settle into still pools of humidity, moss dark beneath live oaks. Southern heat makes us grateful for southern trees. The maples in our front yard flew in spring on helicopter wings. In fall, we splashed in colored leaves, but never sought sap from these southern trees. Frankly, my dear, that's a magnolia, I tell her, fingering the deep green, nearly plastic leaves, amazed how little a northern girl knows about southern trees. I've never forgotten the charred, bitter fruit of holidays, poplars, nor will I. It's part of what makes me Evie. I grew up in the shadow of southern trees. Next by Evie Shockley, Senzo. Carnegie Hall, October 19th, 2014. Beauty eludes me, usually. I soak up the lush red, violet, indigo blooms Abdullah Ibrahim's cool fingers pluck from the keyboard's bed, but bring to these rooms Stanzas forged from replayed past as today's not news. No solacing bouquets. My weeds? I conjure rough green to rupture from seeds. So furious they bleed, or grieving, raise crabgrass and blue notes, peppered with rust where he grows flowers. Yes, I tend my plants incisively. No phrase that droops or wants out of the sun survives long. But the rest run wild, flush vivid, throw shade, deluge fruit, lavishly express their dissonant root. Last for the poems that we have today, Shall Become As by Evie Shockley. You put this pen in my hand and you take the pen from my hand. The night before the full moon, the moon seems full. What is missing is a dark, hungry sickle, the sliver of shadow eating us up inside. After the mountains breathe their mint and sorrow green against the long summer sky, they burst into hot October laughter, lighting the horizon with citrus, rust, and blood. You put this knife in my hand. We pull. We meet as oceans come together, heaving against and clinging across our salt watery boundary. We approach endlessly like two rails of one track, tied in a parallel that promises our eyes to merge someplace far off in the distance. 
You put this feather in my palm. My fingers close around flight. Thank you.